You're listening to The Russell Moore Show. And here at The Russell Moore Show, we bring you conversations to help you navigate Christian faith in confusing times. Throughout the last several weeks, we've had conversations on the podcast that revolve around themes in Russell Moore's newest book, Losing Our Religion, An Altar Call for Evangelical America. It's a book that Publishers Weekly says will buoy disillusioned hearts and minds. Losing Our Religion is now available wherever you buy your books. So if you're feeling disillusioned and looking for clear-eyed gospel hope, we hope that you've enjoyed these conversations. And to conclude, we'd like to release a special live event here to you on the podcast that happened August 9th with Beth Moore in Houston. Beth Moore and her Living Proof Ministries team were absolutely amazing to host us, as well as the Woodland Methodist Church, about a great conversation that really gets at the heart of this that comes directly from Russell's book. Russell writes this in Losing Our Religion. And yet, in a world in which everything is politics, everything is a culture war, everything is identity protection, religion becomes a useful tool to take all of that and make it seem transcendent. Well, here, Beth and Russell enjoy a great conversation that's fun, it's funny, and reminds us of the real transcendence of our gospel hope. Listen in to this live recording from Beth Moore and Russell Moore. I wonder if you would give a very warm welcome to my dear friend, Dr. Russell Moore. (laughs) Have a seat with me, my friend. I'm so glad you're here. (laughs) Do you know that we have probably going on 500 people that are joining us on the other side of the screen? So I am very, very happy about it. So what I wanted to talk about I wanted to just hit on some things, first of all, as we get started, that I realized coming into it when I was compiling questions that I myself didn't know. And I thought, I don't know your family dynamic growing up. Like, I don't know where you, do you have siblings? Where were you in the birth order? Tell us where you were raised. Tell us a little bit about you as a child. I was the oldest of three. Okay. Uh, So I have two two younger brothers. I mean, obviously, if I'm the oldest of three, I have two younger brothers. But uh, Well, you might uh, have had two younger sisters. Well, that's true. That's true. Uh, But, um, yeah, I was the oldest, and uh, I was kind of the rule keeper of the three, uh, and grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. And that, that's the only place that you lived in your Only place, time? yeah. Yes. We were in the same house all my life growing really? up. And, and is your mom still there? Your, your my father mom's has still passed there. away. My father died two years ago, but my mom's still there. In Biloxi. In Biloxi, in the same house. And uh, yeah, my brother's you were there too. Yeah. I was telling him that I saw him refer on social media, oh, so many months ago to having uh, read um, the, the novel, The Boys of Biloxi, and I heard him say that it was as true a fiction as he had ever read about his town. And I read it and thought, <laughs> wow, you lived in a very interesting it's, city. Yeah, it's a wild place. Whenever I would talk to people from North Mississippi and they would say, where are you from? And I would say Biloxi, they would say, oh, the oh, fun part of yes. Mississippi. <laughs> yes. uh, we were kind of a wild casino town town, mafia town. It must it, have been. It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy, yeah. And so, and Maria, you were raised there as well. Went to school, public schools, both of you? We did. We were at rival schools. Oh. So we didn't know each other in high school, and we didn't know each other until my, and this is terrible, I said this trying to explain to somebody one time how we met some people at Christianity Today. And I was exhausted. And I said, they said, how did you and Maria meet? And I said, our cousin introduced us. And I could see the Chicago people saying, oh. No, my cousin, her best friend (laughs) introduced us to each other. That's... Now, I got to tell you, so the very first time I was ever in an interview with you was at an ERLC uh, gathering. Uh I think it was the National Convention. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell you what year it was, but 
I'll never forget, because you had me on in that little segment to talk about marriage and family. And I will never forget what you said, because we were just talking about when people ask you, what is, what's the key to a long marriage? Because they've been married 29 years. I've wanted so much for Keith to be here tonight, but he was unable to come. We've been married 45 years, so we're like going on 75 years of marriage between these two <laughs> couples. And, they, they came from a much more uh, just a wholesome background than Keith and I did. We, we've had quite the roller coaster, but I, I don't even know if you remember this, but you said, well, for Maria and me, the key to a successful marriage is that we have made a deal. We can't both be crazy at the same That's time. That's exactly right. I mean, it just was like, I thought, that is it. <laughs> that is exactly it. Right. You have to be able to say, it is my turn. Yeah. It is my turn. And, and there are times when one of us will say, oh, you're going to go crazy right now. Yes, so I yes. need to I'm gonna back be off the grown up bit. in the room for yes. a while. Yeah. Okay. So back to your childhood, you are nine or 10 years old. What did you want to be when you grew up? Well, when I don't know when I was nine or 10, but when I was 12-ish, mm -hmm. I wanted to be a pastor. And I felt a call to ministry. I went to my pastor, who I really respected and, and did all of his life, and said, I think maybe God's calling me to preach. And he said, okay, uh, well, you're going to preach three weeks from tonight at a youth night that we have. And I said, I don't mean God's calling me to preach now. I mean, one day. And he said, yeah, I'll teach you how to do it. And it was absolutely stress inducing to the degree that I can't even uh, say. I went into, there's a little room off the side of the baptistry. I went in there right before, threw up, oh, went I and preached and then went back in there and, and threw, up, threw again. up. I was so nervous. But, and that was three weeks later. So yeah, you did really do it that evening. It was that evening. awful. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. Yeah, but they thought you were darling. I was glad there was not any recording of it. I hope there's not any recording of it. It was really terrible. But he knew what he was doing. Yes, he did. It, in a lot of contexts, that would be terrible because it would be like, oh, isn't this cute? We're having, you know, a little kid church time, but he knew that congregation that they would know how to respond in a way that really was encouraging and affirming, and they did. And did you still attend that church for some years after that? Oh, yeah. And the reason why I bring that up is because there is really something to it. I thought we were closer in age when we each sensed a call to ministry, but boy, you beat me by six years. I was 18. I thought we were both teenagers, 12. That is really, that's really something. But the same kind of thing in that I shared it with my church. And I have said, uh, I have many, many regrets, but I will never regret that. Yeah. Because it held me to it somehow, seeing those same people week after week, even when I would just... Um, just chaos would overtake my life and I would have such a rough road. I still knew I had made that decision and I still had a congregation holding me to it. So there's, were, there's were they, power in were it. Were they affirming and encouraging even though you were a woman? Absolutely. I was explaining where Kat, I was telling Kat Armstrong tonight uh, when she was saying, Beth, don't I remember that at the church where we're, you were for years, you would speak occasionally on Sunday night. I said, yes, yes, I did. But I said, you know, I didn't even know it was a big deal. I didn't know how controversial it was until later. That's what the gift that social media gave us is that we got into one another's business where we, where we did not <laughs> belong. You know, we didn't realize that there was a whole different world where that wasn't approved of. But no, I, so I was telling her, it's just like God I mean, I guess you, God or some people would say the devil had just moved me around like this through my churches. I, I'm a longtime member of churches, so I, I what four or five by the time I was an adult, and those were from moves to different towns or cities. But I just, I, I never ran into that. Now, I didn't also wasn't looking to do their job, but I got to serve shoulder to shoulder with my 
with my brothers, just like I did my sisters. But I will tell you one fascinating thing about it. At least you knew when you went forward that you, or, or you said to your pastor, I'm called to preach. Yeah. That I had no idea what I was called to do. None. I just went, I think that I'm supposed to do something. I don't even know that I knew to use the word ministry necessarily. But what's wonderful is that they were just crowded around me and were so happy for me and shook my hand and gave me the right hand of fellowship and had no idea what I was going to do. And neither did I. What, you know, me, what, was, what could a woman do? So it was, it was a very, very uh, uh, memorable thing. I wanted to talk about some things that we have had in common because our church background has been very similar yeah, because very similar. I also want to get into some of the things that were so different about us because that is even more fun. But we come <laughs> from a very, very similar background in that we were both raised a Southern Baptist. Uh -huh. And when I say we were part of Southern Baptist life, Russell, I don't mean that we were sprinkled with it. I mean, we were fully immersed. Absolutely. I'm talking about the kind drowned, of immersed. Maybe. Yes, drowned. Yeah. Held under until there had been full <laughs> repentance. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you knew, you saw, at what, what would happen if I died today? Where would I go? You made all those decisions still under that immersion. <laughs> that, that was the kind of life. It was my whole life, and it really was Mine used too. To. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, tell them a little bit about, like, what, what a typical week looked like in your upbringing, uh, church-wise. 9.45 Sunday school, mm -hmm. 11 o'clock worship, mm -hmm. 5 o'clock youth choir, mm -hmm. 6 o'clock training union yes. slash discipleship training later when they changed the name of it, 7 o'clock uh, uh, Sunday night worship, Monday night visitation, yes. Wednesday night uh, royal ambassadors, mm -hmm. which was kind of Southern Baptist uh, Boy Scouts Mission. with missions, yes, missions. and mm -hmm. uh, that, and then prayer meeting, except... Uh, I would always go with my grandmother on Wednesday nights, except for the first Wednesday of every month. And she would always say, well, we're, we're not going to go to tonight's business meeting. And so I just assumed business meeting meant you didn't go. And it, finally, it <laughs> dawned on me one day, you well, then what, what did they do? Have Who's ever there? Gone to the business meeting. I should that never would have. have saved you a lot it of really trouble. It really would yes. have. And I asked her years later, I said, why didn't we ever go to the business meeting? And she said, are you kidding? I wanted you to be a Christian. I never wanted you to see all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there came a point where I thought, Grandma, you maybe should have taken me yes, to a business you meeting have taken or two. Me yeah. to a business meeting. That's, no, what you need to know is mine was identical. The only thing, I mean, every bit of it. That is how our convention did, where we had exactly the same Sunday school hour, exactly yep. the same worship hour, exactly the same choir, exactly the same evening worship, and all of the same things on Wednesday night. I just went to the girls' version of the Girl, of the girl Scouts of missions in the Southern Baptist Convention. So these things were absolutely identical. And there was, there was this assumption. I remember in my first church that I was serving, the bulletin would say, SS, 9.45, yes. worship 11, DT, 6 p.m., worship 7 p.m. We all just knew what all these little yes. acronyms meant. We had a woman who moved to our community from New Hampshire, and she assumed that DT meant detox. <laughs> and so she thought this was kind of the emergency recovery uh, place. And she said, I think it's wonderful that you have DT. Yes. I said, oh, yeah. She said, uh, how many people oh, no. do you have in it? And I said, 150. Oh, and she said, that's just... amazing. She said, now, did they stay for worship? I said, well, they're the key leaders of our church, the deacons, everybody is the... <laughs> she still stayed. My family could have used the DT that she was talking about. <laughs> really definitely could have. So that's where things start getting really different because even though both of us felt a call to ministry, um, where this really gets interesting is that we then would have served, if we were both serving full-time ministry by the time we were young adults, I'm talking about in, in our denominational life and in our heritage, we could not have been on further ends of the spectrum. Probably because the so. best way I know to say it is that you, I want to know, where, where did you go to, where did you get your undergrad? Uh, University of Southern Mississippi. Okay, and then your seminary, did you go to... New Orleans, New Orleans for my MDiv uh -huh. and Southern for my PhD. And then you, did you just stay at Southern then? I and that's when Southern, you began yeah. to, yeah, to yeah, teach there. I went on the there. faculty in 2001 and then became 
provost and dean, and we were there for, I think, 16 years okay. altogether. Yeah. Okay, so the really academic route, <laughs> and not only that route to get to where else you were going, but that was where you stayed. You stayed in that academic world. And I thought, when I went, because I, I drew an arrow going that way, and that's where I put you, and then the other way, because I put formal academic training and served in academic world, and then I put the arrow toward me, and I went, not and didn't. That's the... <laughs> That was the only way I knew to say it, exactly. <laughs> the only time I ever served in any capacity at my church where I got paid was when I taught aerobics in the church gym. And <laughs> I don't mind saying that we probably had more people come forward to receive Christ than, than you might have had in your class, I'm just gonna say. Yeah. Because you know, women, you get them in leg warmers and they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna make some decisions, I can tell you that. <laughs> they're gonna make some decisions. But I think it is fair to say, um, even if it was not, just really, really outrageous that we would have held certain stereotypes about one another in our particular worlds in this tradition. And I, I think that's important because part of what we're dealing with in our present culture is that we think in terms of one another as types. Yeah. You would have represented to me a type of person. Mm -hmm. I would have represented a type of person to you, but wouldn't have even known one another to know if that was even vaguely true. Just the stereotypes and really the caricatures. So this, these things came in, they just came part and parcel with the kinds of impressions that we would have had of one another in the world that we were in. And I'm talking about in anybody with us. They were just, we, I, I was a lay person all the way through, still am at my church. And it just was a whole different world and they normally didn't mix until social media. So I wanted to tell you, Russell, where you first really came on my radar. Oh, no. Now, I would have already known because I knew Melissa went the academic route and so she was familiar with you. So I already knew that you were there on Twitter. So what year did you get on Twitter? Do you remember? 2008. 2008. I think that was I got. I think I got on, I jotted mine down. I think I got on, yeah, I got on in, in 2010, so not very long after you. And so I knew who you were and I knew you were there and I would see certain things, but what first made me raise my eyebrows is that I could see that your students, your present students at Southern or past students, I could see how playful and fun they were with you. And I could see how often, I mean, they would take a picture of like a bobblehead of Johnny Cash <laughs> And they would tweet the picture to you, or it would be a poster or something. Some, and they would say, I was thinking of you. And I thought, huh, I, I, I want to just admit this because this is so ridiculous. That was the first I knew you had an actual life. Because I thought, <laughs> okay, well, that's some dimension right there. That's different. Who would expect? So I got to know, where did that even start? We, we, and I'm talking about your, your fandom, <laughs> yes, because I'm assuming it started with Johnny Cash. And so, no, where, why, why that? Was that just, but, were you uh, raised the, on country western oh, music? Oh, yeah, I was raised on country music. And we, had, uh, uh, we had one, it's actually the best gift I've ever been given in my life. Because I had a record, I mean, an old school record of uh, Grand Ole Opry uh, favorites. And... I would listen to that all the time as a kid. And then, uh, you know, there came a point where I would say, I just wish I had that again. Well, you can't, couldn't find it, it's just gone. And my wife found one and had it transferred over to MP3. And so I have it now uh, still. And so that's, yeah, we're, I I, that. I'm a real country music uh, guy to the point that our dog, I was about to bring this up. Yeah. Who May just, he rest in peace. Yes, he just died what, a couple Waylon. weeks ago. Waylon, Waylon Jennings, uh -huh. more. And uh, yeah. You're gonna and, need to tell them what you told uh, us while we were in the green room. Well, we had, uh, had some people filming at the house. Uh, some friends of mine and I are doing this curriculum, the after party on post-partisan church. So they're at the house uh, filming. And the producer, who is a really accomplished, 10-time Emmy Award-winning uh, director-producer, he kind of stayed around. And I said, come on into the dining room table. Well, Waylon died while we were on 
vacation. They had him cremated. And we're still sort of trying to figure out how to lay him to rest. Yes. Uh, and so Maria put the little bag that they gave us with his box in it uh, next to the chair, next to the dining room table, so that we could kind of discuss it as a Over the family. dinner table. Over the family. dinner table. Yes. So he comes in and says, Waylon Jennings, I love Waylon Jennings. Then he goes over and says, well, yeah, what's in the, what's in the bag? And I was like, <laughs> my dead dog. And if that's not as country music as you can get, I don't know. What, it's just what perfect. Is. It is just absolutely perfect. Okay, so I, I was thinking then, so like I'm talking all of them, all, all that whole group of country western singers, that was, that was your thing. Yeah. Okay, except for one of the things that we have in common, because I, I loved soul. I came from a very, very um, eclectic background. Where in my town, that w it was more that kind of, mm -hmm. of music. It wasn't country western. So, and I, I don't know what made it so, but it was, it was a, a blast and a heck of a good way to, to grow up. But we share a love of hymns. Oh, and I, yeah. I'm going to get to your book in just a couple of minutes, but you mentioned several times different hymns. And of course, I could tell you uh, every first, second, and fourth verse of every single one of the hymns yeah. that you mentioned. So it was such great fun. So I just thought I would bring with me tonight my, my Baptist hymnal. Oh, that's hymnal. the 1974. Very yeah. good. <laughs> Very good. It's the best one. Yeah. It really is the best one. And so I thought, here, we're going to just play a little game here. And so I'm going to start a title. And you're going to, first, first of all, you have to tell me what is on page one. Of holy, every, holy, holy. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, you, you may have a Southern Baptist background if you know that page one of every single <laughs> hymnal is holy, holy, holy. Okay, so you're going to finish the title, and if, he do, is, if I stump him, I'm going to bring it to the audience. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Yes, indeed. Then I will sing. Of my Redeemer. Okay. Then it is, hold up. Uh, Christ the Lord. He's risen today. Mm -hmm. Alleluia. You're doing very Alleluia. good. Nothing but, but the blood of Jesus. Yes, very nice. There is power. In the blood. In the blood, yes. Okay, come you sinners. Poor and wounded, but we didn't sing that one in my church. That was one we skipped no, over. No, because. We kind of had a hymnal within the hymnal. You did? Yeah. No, uh, only things certain that we would songs. do. And we had, there's a, there's a hymn. We actually had this huge controversy that broke out in my home church because we had somebody leading worship who didn't do count your blessings the same way. Oh, yeah. For those of you who come from different uh, traditions, the way we sang count your many blessings is count your many blessings, name them one by one. And then you one, helped, one, yes. One. Count your many. <laughs> and he got up and just sang it, I guess, what's the right way. And everybody was like, who does he think he well, is, Mr. Sophisticated? Like <laughs> I can tell you why you, your church didn't like, uh, didn't sing Come You Sinners Poor and Needy, because you might notice that it is on, there are two different versions of it. Right there, that would lose certain people in our churches. <laughs> like if there's a second version, we're not doing it. That is heresy. Okay, and <laughs> bless be the tie that binds. I, I love all of these so much. And so I was thinking to myself, um, and, and the reason why this was on my mind is because my, my granddaughter, Annabeth, is with um, her Aunt Melissa and me all week long. And so this morning on the way to the ministry, I took her uh, with me so that she could do some volunteer work at Living Proof. And we were on our way and I was praying, playing some Brandon Lake um, worship music in, in the car. I said, do, do you like this? Do you have, do, do you listen to this? She said, well, we used to, but we've, we've moved on from that. And so <laughs> I just absolutely loved it. So we found some worship music that they had moved on to. But I just wanted to ask I, you. I can't believe that you missed the, the most distinguishing feature of this okay, 1974 what? What? Baptist hymn. There's a hymn in here called, O oh God of Earth and Outer Space, oh, it's, it's, Bless it's, Our Astronauts. Is that, and uh, whenever we would have a... It's like page 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. And, and every time they would have a, uh, you know, people request your hymns that you want. Those of us in the youth group, that's always what we would choose. Yes. Uh, 
<laughs> no, <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. Do you know in the book when you mentioned, and I'm already crossing over into the book. You remember when you mentioned, because Maria, you can bear witness to this, when, when you said that if you're ever at a different church and they sing, come thou fount, and they leave out the word Ebenezer Drives when it comes to that crazy. part, that Maria has to pat him on the back yeah. and that means just bring it down, bring it down. Don't, okay, you have to explain that. You have well, to explain that. Well, I apparently... Maria says, I do not have a poker face that I no, kind of reveal I think that's fair to what's say. going on. Mm-hmm. And she says, there is an RDM look oh. that you give. And I'm like, what look? She said, just trust me. <laughs> we, there is one. And I will start to give that look because uh, here I raise mine Ebenezer. I mean, that is such a rich, that's such rich biblical imagery. And sometimes people say, well, we don't sing that because nobody knows what Ebenezer is. They think it's Ebenezer Scrooge or <laughs> Ebenezer McDuck or whatever. And like, that's how they learn what exactly. it is. is we, who we who came it. into the world knowing what the gospel exactly. was? They learned it. Exactly. Well, I wanted you to know because we have such similar childhoods that my sister and I, we, you know, we were raised in all these hymns and knew we were singing some pretty deep theology when, I mean, just by road, just out there in the road, not having any, when I think about nothing but the blood, we were singing it, you know, as six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and, and that's just a mind-blowing thing to me, but we had a black and white kind of ragdoll cat that was named Ebenezer, and we would, <laughs> we would hold it up and go, here, here, I raise my Ebenezer, <laughs> to, to the help I've come. It, it was just such a ridiculous, it was one of those things that you have to to be raised in that world to understand. So I but thought- But that actually, you know, somebody asked me this week, said, hey, you know, you've seen a lot. How did you stay a Christian through a lot of crazy stuff? And I thought about it. And honestly, I think hymnody might be the most important thing in my life. What I learned in those hymns, because it embeds, yes, it does. I think, at a much deeper place. Yes. And I was talking to uh, uh, one of my uh, former students who was talking about a dear lady who'd been one of our churches. She has dementia, so she doesn't recognize anybody in the family at all. But if you start singing, mm-hmm. what can wash away my sins? She starts singing and any hymn. And it's because I think it just, it gets at a more primal sort of so. level. And there are times when there's nothing anybody could say to me, but those hymns are still yes. there. And they'll come out and you don't even know that that's. And there are times when I'm praying and then I realize I'm, I'm quoting just as I am yes. or some, some hymn that's in there. And it's, it's been it's indispensable. In, there, in the marrow. So much so that there are times that I'll wake up and realize you know, when your mind is, you realize you're catching up with where your head is and your thoughts, you, like, you wake up out of sleep and I'll be like midway in a hymn in my mind. Yeah. And it might be a hymn that I had not heard in years, but it's, it's getting in there. So here's what I wanted to ask you. So I know that, I know how you feel about hymns, but I thought I would challenge you by asking you, tell us two contemporary worship songs you really love. Well, you know, this is the embarrassing thing is I love 90s CCM. Oh, yes. And as a matter of fact, I have a Spotify you're playlist of 90s my language CCM. Right now. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, mm-hmm. Twyla Paris, God is in control oh, for him, the roller coaster oh, ride of yes. life. Yeah. I mean, those, those 90s uh, DC talk, uh, all of that. And, you know, there was a time I was kind of a little embarrassed by that. And I'm just going to own it. Oh. It's just kind of the Spotify oh. list is right there in public. I got one, I'm too. I'm going to own those 90s. We're going to trade CC. ours. <laughs> okay. We're going to trade ours. Got, Melissa was with me uh, last, what, a couple of weeks ago at an event. And our worship leader, Travis Cottrell, on, uh, that heads up my, um, my team, he, had, he decided to just throw out to the audience a 90s uh, CCM uh, medley and of worship songs. That group had so much fun. You would not <laughs> have believed it. But I looked over at her and she had tears in her eyes and she said, I love this so much because she'd been raised on it. Yeah. It's, it's just such fun music. I did not know that. that that's so good. We're going well, to have to... Well, and you know, I had... 
all through my teenage years, the biggest crush on Amy Grant oh, yes. that anybody has ever had yes. in the world. Yes. Uh, and that Were actually- Were you even a Christian boy if you didn't? That's yeah, that's you. true. And, and, and it's, uh, you know, I was with a, a group of friends who were talking about our, our first concert that we ever went to. And so there, you know, my first concert was Van Halen or my first, <laughs> my first concert was Amy Grant. Oh, yes. <laughs> And that was a conversation killer right there. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> yes, I, I love it But too. we thought that was scandalous at the time. We really thought we were kind of edgy. Oh, yes. Because, you know, she did the, um, uh, the uh, Baby Baby yes, album. Yes, she did. I remember That was kind of crossing over into yes. secular music. And uh-huh. I remember people all thought that she Michael was Lippen immodest. Spirit. Yes, and, you know, oh, so yes. But we yes. loved her. Yes, I, I'm not sure that our present divisiveness in the church does not come from when For Him broke up. I just think <laughs> yeah, that really, that, might be that, was, that was a grievous mistake. I don't, still I recovered. don't think we have recovered <laughs> from not having that group. Okay, I thought this would be a fun question to ask you. If you had to choose one or the other, would you rather preach or teach? Teach. I knew it. I knew you were going to say that, and I would not have known it until the last couple of years. I've got to tell you something because I, I want um, Russell to, to tell you a little bit about it. But he teaches Sunday school at his church, and I am a Sunday school freak. I'm a big believer Me too. In, uh, in Sunday school and taught for 23 years at, my, at, at First Baptist of Houston and just loved it. But I... I want you to talk about it a little bit and why it means so much to you. Because you did Genesis. I prayed, I prayed y'all all through Genesis. Because <laughs> I would text on a Sunday morning, go, what, what chapter are you doing today? And if, it, if you know, we're taking some kind of break, I'm like, I thought we were on 28 for heaven. <laughs> but I just loved it. I just loved it. And did you decide on Revelation or did you go with Exodus? I'm going with Exodus. Okay. And we're going to start Exodus here in, a, here in a few weeks. Uh, because I, I thought about doing Revelation because, because we did first word is what we called it through Genesis. Okay. And I thought maybe I should do last word, Yes, which just, you know, sounds more exciting than second word. But, yes. Uh, yes. but we decided to go with Exodus and we're starting up in a couple of weeks. But I honestly, and this is genuinely the truth, I would rather teach Sunday school than go on a Hawaiian vacation. And it is better for me in terms of just getting me into a good place. Yes. And I, you know, I taught Sunday school all through the time that I was a seminary professor and administrator and missed it. When I became president of the ERLC, mm-hmm. that, was the, that was the thing that I said, I, I mean, because I'm, I'm all over the place every, and I miss teaching Sunday yeah, school too. to the I same still, group of I people. Still do. I still miss and it. And we still have, I mean, we, the Sunday school class uh, that we had in Louisville, we're kind of like, it's almost like the way that Texas A&M grads are. You know, it's like yeah. we're always together. Yes. Whether, you know, we're kind of always in contact with one another. And that Sunday school class just sort of lives on. Yeah. And I want to do a reunion sometime. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And it's still, I was telling some of my friends here recently, I, when I look toward the future and think, what would be the last thing if I was unable to travel anymore and I still had presence of mind and had the strength to be able to do it, what would I probably want to do to the end? Yeah. And that would probably be it, yeah. I, a, a weekly class. I, one thing that it does that I love, and I wonder if you would nod to this, is that a weekly class means that you have to keep getting out there even when you blew it. Yeah. So it was the best thing it could possibly have been for me because I couldn't just learn a couple of messages and then go give them wherever I was asked right. to speak. Um, I was in a situation where I was forced to the next chapter, the next chapter, the next chapter, the next chapter. And that training of, it was a terrible lesson, but I'm going to go next week and teach it again, teach the, you know, the next lesson. It is so good for a teacher. And it's also, uh, I was kind of humbled down sometimes when I needed to. There was one lady in Sunday school class that I taught in Louisville that would fall asleep every week. Mm-hmm. And I would just mm-hmm. be sitting there thinking, you know, just stay home. Yes. Don't yes. come in here yes. and fall asleep. And she would just nod over and do this. And I would just kind of simmer about yes. that for a long time. And then one day, 
were there and she raised her hand and said, pray for me, all of you know that I have severe narcolepsy no, and we have no, to take this over. No, oh, no. I am a monster. No. <laughs> and no, I had a woman, Melissa, you'll remember, I had a woman in my Sunday school class who would tell me, she said, and she was real dry, she said, uh, I don't even want to be here, but the Lord has called me to come to this <laughs> class. It, just, it just was just, I don't even know how to explain what that was like. Okay, I want to ask you this, and we're going to bridge over to the book um, really soon after this, but I, I want to ask you, what text in Scripture could you teach or preach over and over again and never lose passion for it? Like if you, I mean, like you would think, uh-huh, that, that would be it. Oh, there's so many. I know, I know. pick one. Um, I really love the Gospel of John. Yes. And so John 12, uh, yes. I would say, is, is yes. probably what I would choose. Yes. Yeah, John 12, I, I, I'm taken back to that yes. a lot. If yeah, I'm lifted up, I will draw people to myself. Yes. I mean, that's... Yes. Uh, one of the most wonderful parts of getting older, and I, I'm many years your senior, but you'd already be experiencing this, is that if you stick it out with the Lord Jesus, those scriptures, I mean, there are times, and this sounds weird, but there are times I'll open my Bible and just like press my fingers on, you know, across the page, across, down that chapter, it may be one that I know so well, but I'll think to myself, just the, all the times that the Lord has spoken my what felt like a, my dead soul back to life through the scriptures, yeah. just the breath of the scriptures. It, it just gets dearer and dearer because you live those things. I can remember my grandmother just would cry all the way through the hymns and she loved going to church and I just couldn't understand it. And then, you know, it, it happened to me where I thought, I've, you know, you don't just sing those songs anymore. Now you have lived those songs. And, and for me, I know this sounds really fundamentalist of me, but, I have a love for the King James Version because in our, in our church, it was a KJV only church, but just because we didn't know there were any other translations. I see, yes. And so we yes. had that, so th that is so embedded in me. And there are certain texts that if they're not in that KJV cadence, it just throws me it, off. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. Yes just is so much better yes. than shepherds were kind of scared yeah, or you've whatever. Never yeah. been, no, that's right. You've never been really afraid until you're sore with sore it. Sore afraid, yes. that's right. Yes, no, I'm, I'm with you. And some of the Psalms, it's like, oh no, you have to do it. And I'm not the same way. I, I bridged over to the NIV pretty, pretty early in my well, teaching life. Well, and I do life. too. I yeah. do too in terms of, of teaching preaching. But when I really need yes. to just, pray through something and speak through it uh, or be spoken to through it. Um, go back I go to, to the King, King James Absolutely, version, absolutely. Just... So you are a really big reader. And I, I was curious before I get into your book, what is your favorite genre? What do you, what do you like? I, I think I see that you like a mix of things. But... I do like a mix of uh -huh. things, but I like, I like fiction uh -huh. probably more than, and there's certain, Some of your favorite certain fiction writers, writers, writers that I like. I love Wendell Berry. Uh -huh. I love... Uh, Eudora Welty, of course, I'm a Mississippian. I love, um, I, I love Marilyn Robinson. Yes. Uh, Walker Percy are, are yes. some of my favorites. Yes. Uh, Frederick Buechner, who's, who's both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, well, uh, Robinson and, and Barry are too. So they kind, of, they kind of blend through categories. But I have in my uh, library at home, there's one sort of uh, shelf uh, or bookcase that's my favorite go-to people, yes. and it's Barry and Beekner and yes. Percy and Robinson. Always yeah. just an arm's length away. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. I'm, I'm with you. I like to read uh, several different kinds of books all, all at once. Yeah. You know, I, I want to read them simultaneously, where maybe one is in the evening, one is maybe, maybe I'm listening to it on um, audio on my way home from work, whatever it may be, but I just, I just absolutely love it. But I, I want I can't to, do that though. You can't? I can't listen to audio books because I'm too easily distracted. And so I'll, you know, be off thinking about something else and come and back think, and say, what in the world about? is this? <laughs> yes. It's the same way, Maria, it drives her crazy when it comes to watching movies because 
if I'm left to myself, I'm going to watch a movie five minutes at a time. Watch five minutes, oh, pause okay. it, go do something else, come back. Uh, and so we'll be watching a movie, unless I'm in a theater where they force you to be in the yes. dark and you can't yes. do anything else, yes. I'm going to get doing other things. And then suddenly I'm like, wait a minute, did somebody die? What happened? Yeah. What happened like, to this him? This whole movie's a murder mystery. And I didn't. Well, I'm going to tell you, Russell, I'm glad that you had the focus enough to see this through because this book <laughs> is fantastic. And I, have, have any of you already read it? See, this is when I really love to know. Okay, I'm so glad to know that because just just came out. Okay, what day? How how many days has it been out? July 25th. Okay, yeah. and so I was noticing today when I looked it up that it's still number one in theology books on Amazon, and that is fantastic. There's a lot of books on Amazon. A lot of books. Um, Losing Our Religion, an altar call for evangelical America. I just can't tell you how preoccupied I got with it. I got to read the manuscript version. So it was in a printout in a notebook. I'm, I can't read, I don't like to read um, a manuscript on a screen. Neither. I want very, I either want to hear it or I want to read the hard copy of it. And uh, so I got it, printed it out and read it. And I literally, every other paragraph, I just kept underlining and underlining and underlining th- throughout the book. The, the chapter on tribalism, and I want, to get, I want to say it right, losing our authority, how truth can save us from tribalism is worth the entire price of the book. It's so good. I want to take you to the beginning of it because I already knew the story you were going to tell in the introduction. I didn't know it would be in the introduction, but I, that's when the Moors and the Moors uh, came to know one another was through uh, this crisis. I was just feeling chills come on my arms. It still mm-hmm. is big. You yeah. know, it still is big. But as I was reading the introduction, I could feel the heat on my neck. <laughs> I literally, I, I, I'm not going to be so strong as to call it PTSD, but I thought I could just feel all of it um, all over me and um, thought it's such a book of hope throughout. I had someone say to me, I've had a couple of different people say that that last chapter is so beautiful. It is. I've had so many people tell me that they wept through it, Uh, but it's not only that it ends with hope, it is very much woven throughout. Very, very much. So much scripture in it. But you do begin it with the story of, of loss and of disruption. And I, I want to talk about that for a moment because one of, of the things that we had in common, it was the timing of it, yes, but also the fact that it's impactful over a family. It's not just Mm. you. When something happens and you find yourself at odds with your own community. And one reason why I wanted to bring up the background that we've both had is that we would say as different as our worlds were, we had such deep belonging, such deep roots, and so to lose that sense. So talk a little bit about that just family-wise, what that was like, not just for you, but to see it reflected in your own family, the toll it was taking. Well, you know, I, this is about two or three weeks ago, my 22-year-old son who's in the Air Force uh, called me and said, uh, hey, Dad, I got a question real quick. Uh, my church that I'm part of now out here in Idaho is where he is. He said, uh, I, I have to give my testimony tonight uh, since I've, I've joined the church now. He said, I just want to make sure I've got all the timeline right. He said, but there's a, we were like part of Southern Baptist Church for most of the time. And then we were at a non-denominational church. Was there a reason for that? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I just said, I don't know whether to have you cognitively tested <laughs> Or, or to give the Lord his to praise. To be really proud of the <laughs> yes. fact that you were sort of uh, kept out of this, yes. um, which I didn't know that they would be. And that was a big concern for me because I had such a good uh, church experience that I, yes. that I needed is that I didn't want the kids to be affected by all the chaos all the and same. crisis. And when my... Hey, Samuel, our son, when he was 15, in the middle of some of the worst times, he went to Maria and said, 
I can handle it, but I need you to level with me. Has dad had like some sort of moral failure <laughs> or what? And Maria was not happy, uh, not, not unhappy with him, but unhappy with the situation. Yes. And I was, it crushed me because yes. I know what it was like to be a 15 year old going through yes. a sort of spiritual crisis. So I said, hey, Samuel, why don't you come with me to the SBC executive committee where they're going to sort of read out their grievances. I want you to hear every bit of that. Um, and so he did. He came in, my grandmother's rule about the business meetings. Boy, I really broke that one with him. Yes. Uh, and so he sat there through the whole thing and we left and I said, what'd you think? And he said, well, um, I feel great about you, <laughs> except that I wonder why are you so committed to being a part of this? Wow. He said that was so angry and stupid. And, uh, you know, it just, why does this? Yes. Uh, and I realized he didn't come out of the same sort of world that I did. Absolutely. Where the sense of belonging yes. was so strong. We've talked about that, Melissa. Amanda, yeah. too, that our kids did not, and I'm not talking about everyone's, but ours, did not have that same thing that they were so rooted in, in denomination. Right. Um, but what I think is a factor here is that there was so much love for it. I think the, the loss, because we loved it, we each loved it. And, and there's not even, so that's, much. that's not even, it's not even past tense. No, it's I'm true. the most Southern Baptist person I know, and I'm not even a Southern Baptist anymore. I mean, I literally have a bust of Lottie Moon. I know. Uh, and, uh, I know. Baptist I know. And Maria, that's... I have to remind him myself <laughs> that I said, you know, that you're no longer. Yes, but. Um, Yes, I do know that. I just call myself a Southern Baptist in the Federal Witness Relocation. Program. Yeah, I, yeah, I think and of myself I like it. I'm still okay. there. So one of the things that's so heartbreaking, and I've heard you tell this uh, here or there in, in an interview about it as well, um, but the ERLC position, the presidency, I mean, it was dream job to you. Yeah, oh yeah. Just, just dream job yeah. to you. So. That's really something when you think, okay, well, you know, how have I lived past this time? Because that was, what do you do after you think, well, was that the peak or what? What, what, what happened there? But I was thinking this morning, my reading was in um, Numbers 13 and 14. It's, you know, when the spies go out to look at, at uh, the promised land and come back and, you know, Joshua and Caleb are, you know, we can surely take it. And the rest of them are like, oh no, we look like grasshoppers. But it says that the people, they put so much fear in the people that the people said to the Lord, did you bring us here to kill us? Mm -hmm. And I thought, isn't that sometimes how it is? Like you'll get your, what you think, this is the position I've waited for all my life. I, I always wanted to do this. And then you say to the Lord, are you trying to kill me here? Mm -hmm. I, I've said to him so many times, if I can survive the path that you've given me, I'm going to tell you it was a really great idea. I just don't know if I could live through it or right. not. You understand what I'm right. saying? Right. And uh, so I, I, thought, I thought that was such, such a, a meaningful thing that the Lord would have you, you know, there's life on the other side of that when we think, you know, there's, there's not, yeah, it feels you, like there's not. You were the one telling me that when I was going through uh, sort of the decision-making process and grieving and it, you were one of the ones saying, there's life on the yes. other side, you'll, yes. you'll be okay. And, and I, you know, I, I was that. barely figuring that out for myself, but you know, if you're trying to walk along with someone you know, you're just like, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. Um, but w an odd way that the Lord works, uh, Russell, is that even though for our events, and I know you're finding the same thing, are, are so different. It's such a different makeup of people. But when I'll ask if, you know, if any of you done the Bible studies, so few hands, or have you been to an event like this before? So few hands. And I realize that sometimes the Lord is doing for us what we begged him to, and that's given us opportunities to minister to people that have not had that same ministry. And yet, you know, it just, it's so painful. I wanna, I wanna read something um, 
out of, of the book, or I want to at least mention it, because you, one of the gifts that you have, you can put something in a nutshell. When I was talking in the introduction, what a great thinker you are, and I, I don't say that lightly. The ability to put something that a lot of us sense and feel and, and would use a paragraph or a page to say, you could put in a sentence. And to me, and this is not just the only place that it makes this point, but I, I wanna read this. You were talking about the disruptions of the past few years. I'm reading out of page 20. And you said, um, after the di disruption of the past few years though, the primary critique of evangelical Christianity from the outside world as well as from those of us who found ourselves accidental exiles within the church is not that evangelical Christianity believes and practices all these things, but that we don't. You make the point later in the book too, and I've heard you say it a few times, that you feel like part, uh, when we talk about the decline that it seems like people are, less people are drawn to a church, less people are confessing Christianity, whatever. When, when we say, you know, what is the root cause of that? One of the things that you have said that I thought was so profound is that they're looking at us not going, I, that they think what we believe is so nutty as they believe that we don't believe what we're saying we believe. And we're not living out the authenticity of what we said. Uh, we teach a certain kind of ethics, for instance, but then we, we, don't, we don't live it. And it's like, no, no, you, it, at the end of the day, are having a crisis of faith. It's not just, uh, just issues. This is a crisis of faith. Do you even believe what you say you do? Do you believe that we are justified by faith, for instance? So I, I, I love that and wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that, that expound on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think it, I, I noticed this shift that happened. I mean, I have always had people who would come and talk to me and say, I think I'm losing my faith. I think I'm going to leave uh, the church. It's always happened. It's always yes. happened since AD 33. Uh, but usually it was because somebody would say, you know, I, I went away to college and I got exposed to some new ideas and I just don't think I can believe the supernatural anymore. I can't believe in virgin births and empty tombs anymore. Or somebody would say, I don't, I don't like the strict moral rules uh, that come with the church. Usually I have to do with sex, but they say, I don't like that. And so mm -hmm. I'm walking away. There came a point where that almost, almost yes. stopped altogether. And you would have people who really were real deal committed uh, to uh, the, the, the gospel and to the scriptures. And who would say, wait, has this all just been a means to an yes, end? Yes. Is this really just about something else? And that's, that's what's really disturbing uh, to them. And I, I remember I was teaching on a really secular uh, university campus. All of my students, uh, just about, were atheists and agnostics who'd never met an evangelical Christian before, till me. And one of them said to me, uh, he was asking me some theological questions and I was answering it. And he says, so wait a minute. So you're like, what do they call it? Like a Bible thumping fundamentalist. <laughs> and I said, I feel so seen. That is exactly <laughs> what I am. And uh, after, you know, several years of being called a cultural Marxist, uh, I yes. feel like, yes, you, you yes. see, you see what you it, see me, you see me. <laughs> and that's what I think, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the people that I talk to who are in this moment and some of them, a lot of the people that we say uh, they're, they're deconstructing, which can mean any number yes. of things. But even the people who are really what we think of as deconstructing, uh, don't give up on them. No. I mean, a lot of times they're going through this process of sorting through and saying, uh, was this real or not? And a lot of them are, are going to conclude, 
yes. yes. But it takes a process yes. sometimes for them to get there. Yeah, you take 30 years ago, and I would have been alongside people that were on all sorts of places in their journey. They weren't putting it on social media as if like, now I'm leaving. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And one of the things I'm praying for, because I believe in the holding power of Jesus. I really, really do. Yeah. I think I, I, don't, I don't get as worked up when people need, feel like they need to go a different way for a while because I believe if, if you have tasted and seen, if, if you have come and seen, as Jesus would say, come and see, that he would be impossible to replace. So I always think, you know, sooner or later, there's a really good chance that they'll come back around to Jesus. Maybe not the, the tradition that they were raised in, but uh, perhaps they'll come back to Jesus. But in those days, but we have to be willing to let them and I, one of the things that we're going to have to do in the coming years, in the next three or four or five years, is that we have to be gracious when people go, well, you know, I know I said this, but maybe, maybe I'm working my way back. That's I know someone exactly is happening right. to right now. That's exactly right. Now. Right. He's going, he's starting, he left the uh, Christian music altogether, but he's starting to to sing some of those songs at some of his concerts. Well, what's going on there? Just that I think he misses him. Yeah. And so if we just wouldn't overreact and let people take their journey. Um, I you know, think- I was just telling somebody uh, yesterday about parenting. Um, I said the biggest thing I learned from child one to child three is what not to freak out about. Yes. Because when you're, your first child, you're like, okay, what, what, what is this? Is this, yes. uh, you know, what does this mean? Yes. And by the third one, you're like, okay, that's just normal. They're gonna be fine. That's just, uh, they're, they're gonna be okay. They're, middle school's tough for everybody. They're, they're gonna, there's a way through it. Uh, and I think the same thing is true with one another. There's a way that we can overreact when somebody is going through those dark nights of the soul. Yes. In which uh, we can respond in such a way uh, that, that actually would not give somebody a path to come back right. if the Lord leads exactly. them Exactly. And I, I think that's... That would be a, a severe mistake. A ser- severe mistake. Yeah. Um, I love the portion where you were talking on pages 108 and 109. You're quoting uh, political scientist Christopher... M- is it Freeman? Freeman. Okay. And he's saying, he says something that you quote that uh, is so true... It says, we hate the other team more than we like our team. That, that, that's what it's come to, is that really we're more motivated by hating them than we are liking our own team. Let that rest on you a little while. So, uh, why? We need to ramp up our animosity to the out party to rationalize our continued dedication to our own party despite its obvious shortcomings. So... When it proves inconsistent, which of course human systems are always going to do, this is not the gospel. These are human systems, and you know we're we're humans with them, uh, flawed and 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 um, and have our own hypocrisies. But when they prove inconsistent, then you know immediately it's well instead of just admitting, well we sort of blew it here, or this was you know this was really really out of nowhere here, instead of that, then, well, look at the other side. Yeah. And so it's the constant, I hate more, you more than I love us, um, but I have to stay with us, so I, I have to continue to hate you. I thought it was so good. And you talked about this cross-cutting, um, and I, I'm going to define it. I just wondered if you would expound on it a little bit. People whose partisan identities do not align with their other social identities in the standard pattern. I picture a Prius driving Unitarian Republican who regularly attends vegan cooking classes because these people have their identities not all bound up in one temporal thing or another. He argues they are, and now I'm quoting him, less hostile to out party members and less likely to get angry about politics. Here, this is so good. But as these cross cutters grow scarce, politics gets bloodier. And then you say when religious identity is added to the mix, the stakes grow even higher. Want to make any more comments on that? I'll just love that cross Yeah, it's, we're, we're at a time where 
Politics is asked to bear a weight that it cannot it support uh, when it comes to your entire identity. And, and here's what happens. It's not just that people get exhausted and burned out because you're having to, and, and that same political scientist says, calls it identity vigilance. Yes. So you have to constantly be at, looking around. Am I still part of the team? Yes. And does everybody know I'm part of the team? That's exhausting. But it's also the case that when people actually do encounter people who are in the out group, whatever that out group is, and they're not villains, yes. they start to see them as a human being, yes. that can be even more disorienting yes. uh, to people. Yes. And I mean, I, I had, um, I had a, a woman, it, it just stays in my mind all the time, who came up to me at my church and said, my daughter's having a theological crisis uh, because she's gone away to college. And I thought she was going to say she's gotten in with a, the wrong group of friends or something like she's being tempted to do things she doesn't believe. No. She said she's with these very secular, non-Christian people. And she says, Mom, a lot of them demonstrate peace, joy, love, gentleness, kindness, self-control more than the Christians I know. Now, we have a biblical explanation mm -hmm. for why that is. Yes. People are created in the image of God. Yes. Nobody is just their sets of, yes. of ideas or, or ideologies. But when somebody encounters that, when you think the people who disagree with me are supervillains in a lair yes. plotting to destroy me, and then you find out that's not true, uh, it can it can just completely disorient yes. a person. Yes. And you, and, and, but it's so rare because we're almost never in a situation where we're even together. People are sorting out into zip codes. They're sorting out into, uh, in, into all of these different places. And uh, someone said to me uh, not long ago, said, how do, this was somebody outside the church, said, how do um, evangelical churches sort of deal with, you know, Republicans and Democrats in their congregation uh, getting along. And I said, this so rarely happens because it's so rare that you have congregations that have both Republicans and Democrats in them. Mm. You have Republican congregations and Democratic uh, congregations, yes. but you very rarely yes. have them together uh, in the way that, uh, I'm sure it was the same case uh, with you, but it was yes. for me in Mississippi. We would have people in the congregation who were very different uh, on, on sort of different sides of things and would argue about things but could come together around the table. Absolutely. That Not only does that not happen in church, it doesn't happen anywhere. Yes. You're, you shop at Whole Foods or Walmart. Yes. yes. You know, and, it, and that is, it, it tells you, uh, you, you watch Fox News uh -huh. or you yes. listen to NPR. And it tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, yes. and it just sorts people out yes. in this artificial sort of way. Uh, and then it gives us this sense of anxiety yeah. about, uh, because there are people, there's a, there's a, uh, a woman who's a researcher that, whose work was really meaningful to me, Amanda Ripley, talks about conflict entrepreneurs. There are people who, for whom it's in their interest to keep you in a state of siege and of conflict. Yes. And that's especially true in a social media yes. era where people can build a platform not by growing a church or by uh, something else. They can build a platform by anger. Yes. And by keeping people angry and tapping into that limbic system and yes. giving you those little hits of dopamine. Yes. Well, that, that leaves you burned it out. Does. And it also leaves you in a place where you can't recognize yourself anymore. I, I think that's so true. I think we are so overstimulated that we're numb. Yeah. And so I think that in order to feel something, we need to feel mad and angry. And so we look for opportunities. So and it oh, takes I, more and more and more. It's just like any addiction. It is. You need more, more and, and more. more and more it's to get the same right. result. It's, there's, got, there's got to be something to be angry now. Thanks so much for listening to this live event with Beth Moore and Russell Moore. Again, a special thank you to the Woodlands Methodist Church in Woodlands, Texas, and to Living Proof Ministries and Beth Moore for hosting such a fantastic event. 
Be sure to tune in to a second episode also releasing where you'll get to hear some of the lighthearted and deep questions from the live audience on August 9th with Russell and Beth. Join us for that episode as well. Thanks again. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Host, Russell Moore. Producer, Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azure Phelps. Director of Operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Audio engineering is provided by Dan Phelps. Our video producer is Abby Egan. And the theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton.